Amy Meinzer, thanks so much for joining us. We're at the sure. IAA Planetary Defense Conference, and you are a scientist with JPL, and you're doing some pretty interesting work with near-Earth object cameras. Yes, um, so I've been working on a project lately called NEOWISE, which is basically taking a small NASA telescope and using it to scan the sky for asteroids. And we did that through the course of one year in 2010, and we saw a lot of asteroids, more than 158,000. But most of those were in the main belt between Mars and Jupiter. And of the ones that get particularly close to Earth, the so-called near-Earth objects, we saw about 700 of those. But that's only a tiny fraction of what's out there. Now, the sample was very valuable for a lot of different reasons, but we, we've long realized that it would be really good to go out and do a much bigger, more comprehensive survey that could really find a large fraction of the near-Earth object population. And to do that, we kind of redesigned WISE, so to speak, uh, to really specialize on asteroid discovery. That project is called the Near-Earth Object Camera, or NEOCAM for short, and the basic goal is to just go out and find a heck of a lot of near-Earth objects. And how successful do you feel you are with this project? How far along the road are you? Right, so all NASA projects, as you probably know, <laughs> have have long histories with lots of ups and downs and all that. Now this project uh, I first proposed to what's called NASA's Discovery Program. And that was first in 2005 and then again in 2010. And the Discovery Program is a line of kind of medium-sized NASA missions that are competed. So they're competitively selected. Many teams compete for one chance to launch. So I've proposed twice now. And in 2010, we were funded to develop the detectors for the mission. And we're really happy about that because one of the things that's going to be the key enabling technology for really doing a better job of surveying for asteroids from space is we've got to have the right detectors. That's the key to everything. And so with the technology development funding, we've been able to go out and make these new detector prototypes. And we just have a paper accepted on them. We're really excited about it. We've got three really beautiful detectors that meet all of our requirements. And we're just now in the process of making more and continuing to characterize them further. Congratulations on that. And I understand one of these has a 16 million pixel resolution. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's right. So, you know, infrared cameras, these are, these are heat sensing cameras. So unlike visible light, where you're sensing the light that's reflecting off the surface of an object, like an asteroid, instead, you're seeing the heat that is emitted by the object. So when these asteroids are out there floating in space, if they're in kind of Earth-like orbits, they're going to be about the same temperature as the Earth, so kind of room temperature. It turns out that these things glow very brightly at infrared wavelengths, in which, of course, we perceive as heat here on the ground. Well, the thing is, is you know, everybody's got a cell phone camera now, which has you know, zillions of megapixels. Mm -hmm. But infrared technology has, has lagged behind. And that's just because there isn't this incredible commercial pressure to, to build larger and larger detectors. So now we're finally starting to catch up. And with some of the ground-based infrared sensors now, the first generations are being delivered that are megapixel and even larger. Now for our application, for NeoCam, we need a particularly long wavelength of infrared light, about 20 times what your eye can see. And to do that, what we've got to do is we've got to kind of change up the composition a little bit of the detector, which is what we did with our prototype. And now we've got a megapixel sensor, which is a big deal for these wavelengths because it hasn't been done before. And you're working in partnership with Teledyne, Teledyne and JPL together yeah, on this project. Yeah, along with the University of Rochester. So there's kind of a, a trio of, 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 of groups here. It's basically University of Rochester, Teledyne, and, and JPL. And we've been working on this project for close to 10 years now, since the first discovery proposal in 2005. So we're really happy that we finally have a, have a breakthrough here. Um, we finally have a, a new detector that can work at the relatively balmy temperature mm. of 35 Kelvin, which is 35 degrees above absolute zero. <laughs> so That's impressive. That sounds pretty cold to most people, but to an astronomer like me, that mm. is like a day at the beach. Mm -hmm. Because uh, other infrared sensors that operate at these wavelengths, like the ones we used on WISE, had to be 8 Kelvin, really cold. And the only way to achieve a temperature that cold is you've got to use things like you know, solid hydrogen or liquid helium or really exotic refrigerators. So we wanted to get away from that with NeoCam because uh, we want to be able to have a mission that will last a long time if we just kind of put it out in deep space a little ways, a ways away from the Earth so we're not getting kind of blinded by the heat from the Earth. We need this detector because it can operate at the, at the balmy temperature of 35 Kelvin which we can achieve just by sitting out in deep space with a sunshade in front of us. 
So we're really happy about That's that. That's impressive. So not only do you have uh, more sophisticated um, and more capable sensors, but they're easier for you to deploy. Right. That's one of the keys. Uh, the, the trick here is, of course, yes, if you have infinite money, you can build an infinitely complicated system that will do everything, hmm. but you know, we don't want to do that. We need to do something that's efficient, that, that is low cost and not much risk, something very similar to other things we've already done, so we have confidence that we can build it again. And the simplest thing for us was to basically just modify the detector slightly so that it can go out to the longer wavelengths while still working at the higher temperatures. And if we do that, then we have a mission that could go out and unlike WISE, which was limited to about eight months of fully cryogenic operations, now we have a mission that could last for many more years. Excellent. It's very interesting to me that you and I sort of work at opposite ends of the spectrum. You're a specialist with asteroids and asteroid detectors and sensors, and I'm a meteorite specialist. So <laughs> I collect on our planet what's left over from asteroids that make it to Earth. That's right. And I am frequently asked, how much danger are we in from large impacts and what's being done about it? And it seems that there is a much greater interest and focus on searching for potentially dangerous NEOs. Do you feel that we're all moving in the right direction? Does more need to be done? Well, here's what we've learned from NEOWISE so far. So we've used our sample of about 700 near-Earth asteroids to extrapolate what's actually out there. And because we're an infrared survey telescope, we are sensitive to the very light-colored asteroids as well as the very dark-colored asteroids. And that gives us a, a representative sample, if you will. So if we ex extrapolate what we've learned from NEOWISE, this is what we found. There's good news and there's not so good news. <laughs> the good news is that for the really large asteroids, the ones larger than a kilometer, these are the things very much like the dinosaur killing impactor 65 million years ago, 90% of those and maybe even more have been discovered to date. So that's great. And that means that there's very little chance that there's a civilization destroying Earth impactor out there in the future that we haven't already found. Now, when we get to smaller sizes, which are still quite a bit larger in most cases than the impactor that just uh, exploded over Russia in 2013. For those, the situation is not as good. Uh, we have not discovered nearly as many of those. At, for objects that are about 100 meters in diameter, which is about the size of a football field, with NEOWISE, we found that there are about 20,500 of these objects, larger than 100 meters, and only about 25% of them have been discovered to date. So clearly, there's a lot more work to be done. If you go to even smaller sizes than the football field sized objects, then maybe 1% have been found. So we clearly still have a lot more work to do. The good news here is that we can take some fairly, I would say, sensible things, sensible steps that uh, don't involve really crazy heroics uh, to go sure. out and you know, just find the next level down in, in asteroid survey completeness. So I think there's a lot we can do that's quite reasonable. Do you have uh, any overall view about, about the conference? Or are you going to take anything special away with you from the presentations you've seen so far? Yeah, these meetings are always really interesting. And, you know, science really is an international process, uh, and it really thrives on collaboration. We need these meetings because this is how we meet our colleagues, figure out the latest research that's going on, and figure out, you know, should we change direction? Are there different things we need to be looking at or doing? So it's been really helpful from that point of view. And plus, these are a lot of my friends here, so it's, it's great to see them and, and you know, see what they're up to and see what the latest research is. Uh, the, for example, the recent Impactor event, that was a real surprise. And I have a feeling we're going to be studying that for a long time because we really didn't think that objects that small, it's thought to be about 17 to 20 meters across, uh, we really didn't understand what sort of damage they would cause on the ground. And of course, that is going to change how you think about you know, the risk associated with the impacts, uh, what sort of surveys do you want to do, how do you follow up on these, on these potential targets uh, that you might find. So it's really a work in progress. This field is evolving very quickly. And that's Indeed. an exciting part to be, you know, yes. to be in. <laughs> well, and in my work too with meteorites, and, and our fields are, are very closely yeah. related. By, by recovering meteorite fragments and studying their distribution, we get an idea of how large the initial mass was, how do these pieces fragment, and hopefully over time, the study of recovered meteorites can teach us more about how we might be able to protect ourselves against really big ones. Absolutely. It's an important point, actually, that you can learn a lot from doing the comparison between what we see in space with what we find on the ground, when we, when we can actually pick up the objects and you know, cut them open and see what's inside and then see if we can use that as sort of a ground truth, if you will, 
to help us understand what we see when we look with our telescopes. Because of course, with a telescope, you don't get anything like the kind of information you do when you actually crack one open, you know, from the ground. So this helps us to understand, you know, and place in better context, I guess you could say, what we're seeing when we look out there. And how can we use that to infer more about the population that hasn't been discovered, which is, you know, basically 99% of all the stuff that we think is out there down to Chelyabinsk sizes. Indeed. Amy, thank you so much for sharing your very specialized expertise with us. It's fascinating work. Asteroids, cameras, sensors, a bit of a link to meteorites, my favorite subject. It's been most illuminating, and I look forward to speaking with you again in the future and finding out what other amazing developments you're working on. That sounds great, and thanks for talking.